welcome everyone online and welcome everyone here in person. This is our first ever field engineering live. All right, this is, uh, this is kind of a new experience for us here. If anyone's seen uh, Phil and I, we do a series called Field Engineering where we ask a lot of, uh, or we address a lot of technical questions that you guys run into all the time. Just some of the things we do here at Jackson to really try to be different and help you guys out in the field and get you on to the next job. Make you better, that's what we want to do. Um, there's a couple things here first. I want to make sure everybody online knows this, that there is a poll. Uh, we want your interaction here. We're going to ask some questions. We're going to prompt you to participate. And everyone here has either accessed that yet. Has everybody done that yet? Any troubles? Everyone's good? Good. So um, that is the website, that bit.ly link right there, bit.ly slash F-E zoning. Uh, it's for the people here in person. Sorry, people here in person. This is how you interact. The other people online got their own way to interact. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, so again, this is field engineering. Um, I got to do some housekeeping things first for just the people online, so bear with me here. Don't check out too quickly. Um, there's the video that's in the middle here. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of windows around that video. These are all tools to help you have the best viewing experience possible. Uh, the Q&A box there, that's where you're going to ask questions, and we will respond uh, in a timely fashion as quick as possible. Uh, there's also the slides there to the right, as you can see right there. Uh, those are the slides so you can follow along. There's also a resource and download list. I think there's only a couple files in there. We might throw some like line cards if you want to download, you know, the zoning or anything like that. Uh, the speaker bio, if you're really curious about who <laughs> Phil and I are and really want to dig deep, you can check out that bio box. Uh, there's also a Or you can go to the post office where you're there too. <laughs> right, posted up there. <laughs> uh, there's also a survey. This is very important. If you are online watching, Fill out a survey, and we will take your survey and pick a random participant and give away to our prize. Uh, we'll shoot a video and send it to you that you won, and we're going to do that here, too. So everybody in here, when we're done, we're going to pass out a survey. If you fill it out, we're going to put you in this dampener right here, <laughs> and uh, we're going to pick a random drawing for this awesome multimeter. So somebody's going to leave here with some cool swag. Um, there's also a uh, certification in there and the questions button. So hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory uh, for everybody watching online. And please let us know if you're having any connection issues too. Um, that's also helpful as well. So uh, Phil, um, I also need to tell people that if you are watching this online, don't have Netflix open. That's like a no-brainer. Don't eat the bandwidth up there. Um, <laughs> don't, uh, don't watch this on your phone. It's just not going to be that great. This isn't designed to be watched on your cell phone. And uh, don't use those cheap, crappy browsers, okay? Use like Chrome or one of the, you know, the big names. Well, don't use Firefox or Netscape. I don't even know what that red O is. I think that's just a generic Opera. Is it Opera? Really? Oh, nice. Good call. All right. So, uh, and then also, once this is over, this training will be available to watch in our on-demand section, okay, 48 hours. It only takes a couple days to get up, but you guys can go back if you missed it or if you caught something or there's a huge blooper uh, that you want to see again, you can go to the Jackson Systems On Demand and watch this live field engineering episode, just not live. Okay, so I am your host for field engineering, and as always, uh, Phil Kimball is with me. He is our um, resident pro here. A lot of you guys probably talked to Phil on a, uh, on a hopefully not a daily basis. No, they don't call me daily. <laughs> good. They call me Phil. They call, oh, that's, that's good. Look at that. We're already <laughs> off to a great start. Uh, Phil has been with Jackson for 14 years. He knows his stuff. Phil, how long have you been in the industry, though? You've been, you've been around. Uh, it was a little after Abe Lincoln was assassinated, but, uh, oh. yeah, it's been 40-plus years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nice. Nice, yeah. So that's, that's a lot of experience that we're bringing to the table here. So some key takeaways here. We want everyone watching this to have a better understanding of zoning, okay? Zoning is one of, the mis one of the most misunderstood concepts in the comfort industry, okay? A lot of people have different feelings and opinions about it. We're hoping to just shatter those and say, look, guys, it's not that complicated. It's not going to kill you. 
just we want you to have a better understanding of how to do a proper zone system, whether it's in new construction, especially retrofit zoning. Uh, we want you to learn how to diagnose problems. Um, common problems that you run into, there's easy ways to find these, okay? I know if you put in a piece of equipment and you add zoning to the mix, you're like, holy cow, now the system's totally different. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why it's overheating or I don't know why it keeps tripping on limit, okay? We're going to help you diagnose some of these issues. Um, and we want you to be confident. Confident in your ability to find a solution and really, to be honest, confident in your ability to sell this to your customer base. Because guess what? Everybody has temperature issues in their home, okay? Fact. Whether it's a ranch on a slab or a two-story house, there's always going to be areas just because air travels differently and heat always rises. So zoning is very important. This is a way to keep your customers comfy. And it's, it's, a, great, it's a great revenue stream. Okay, you need to have that in your repertoire. So, Phil, we are going to do our first poll. Okay, so everybody got their uh, smart devices. Everybody online participating. Once you to uh, fill out, do you currently install zoning? <laughs> it can be retrofit, it can be new construction. Click yes or no. Do you guys do zoning? I know that's not a it's a tough question. So yes or no. Phil, do you do zoning? No, I don't. You don't. Okay. No, I'm not a I'm not a, <laughs> a licensed contractor. Right. I, I miss my calling, but yeah. I don't like crawling in crawl spaces and going up in attics and I'm right. afraid of ladders. So Ugh, I just learned terrible. everything. Is it not the on hard your phone way. there? Did you click attend? Yeah, I'm working. Yeah, I'm watching. Is the poll up, Tyler? Okay, it's up now. I guess. <laughs> There's a delay. Yes. Slightly. Satellite link down, you know, to the truck, and then. The anybody? Do anybody else have troubles filling that out? I, I'm, I'm at this spot right here. Oh, there it is. Just popped up. Okay. So this is just kind of we want to collect some data from everybody here and online to see like what the percentage of people that are zoning. I think, I don't know. I'd say pro, I'd, I'd hope it'd be at least forty percent. That's what I'm hoping. For. What do you think, Phil? Probably in that neighborhood, you know. Yeah. Uh, too bad we're not we're we're not the only company uh, with regards to zone control products. Correct. Uh, the zone, you know, the zoning industry is very very large. Right. Um, we weren't the first ones to you know jump into the pond, uh, but Jackson Systems has been around quite a while. Right. Uh, actually, zone control at Jackson Systems goes further than this company goes back to uh you know what the our our founder ron jackson that's right many many years ago in fact when i worked for a company uh in canada named enerstat mm -hmm. they were a temperature controls company i was their national sales manager ron came to us uh to work with him in his zoning concepts uh in developing microprocessor based zoning so we, that goes back close to 20 years ago. But zone control has been around since the 40s. Right. Um, and, it's uh, you know, a lot, a lot of companies in the, <laughs> in the industry. So uh, it's, I would venture to say that there's a lot uh, of contractors who do zoning. Okay. Do we have the results? Ellen, do you, can you see those over there? Because I cannot see those on my screen. It just gives me the yes or no. Do we have the, we have the results? Oh, okay. Holy cow. Look at this. There we go. 73%? That is, I did not expect to see that number. There we go. So 73%, that is a lot higher than I thought. So good, I'm glad uh, we're doing this because apparently a lot more people are doing zoning than I thought. Um, so we're going to dive into some common misconceptions, some myths, if you will. We're going to bust some myths today, <laughs> Phil. Are you ready for that? Sure. <laughs> so, you know, I talk to contractors all over the country. I talk to some of these guys in here. Um, and a lot of feedback that I get when I ask about zoning, I'm like, so what do you guys do for zoning? They're like, eh, we really don't do a lot. Maybe even a custom home. Or, you know, if they don't do new construction, they're just like, yeah, we, we just don't have the manpower. We, don't, we just don't really do it. And I'm like, well, how come you guys don't do it? Well, it's, it's too complicated for our team. You know, they, we're really just service and replacement, things like that. So zoning, Phil, myth, is zoning too complicated for the typical HVAC contractor? No. Now, why is that? 
Well, first of all, zoning doesn't require any special tools that the contractor doesn't already have in his truck. Mm -hmm. um, and based on the companies, you know, you've got, uh, you got installers and you've got guys who are pulling wire and, you know, some companies are, are segregated with regards to specific duties that, uh, right. you know, but you got a one-man shop and he does everything. It doesn't yep. really matter. Zone, if you're installing heating and air conditioning systems, you're doing duct work, uh, there aren't any tools uh, special to yeah. zoning. So everything you use as a heating and air conditioning contractor are the same tools you use for zone control. Nothing special. Right. Now, true, you get into commercial, big commercial applications, that it, and we're not talking about that tonight. We have right. a commercial division. That's uh, that's a whole different exactly. ball game. Everybody in here is residential, right? Is residential or light no, commercial. Well, I, I, know. I forgot. Yeah, we've got we've got some commercial contractors in here. That's too. good. We got Marshall and Mission in here. That's there you right. go. I mean, I mean, there's still you guys zone on residential equipment sometimes, correct? Okay. Right. So I mean, it still it still applies. We're not going to be talking about boilers or chillers or packaged rooftop units or anything like that. But we're going to primarily stay to kind of the residential space, like five to seven and a half ton, kind of. Yeah, it's still, the, but it's still. You're right. It's, it's still the common idea. Um, exactly. So there's some common hurdles I hear a lot from these contractors out there that uh, don't want to do zoning. They're like, oh, the, you know. The duct design is terrible, okay? I can't overcome this. Or the equipment is the wrong size. It's undersized or it's oversized. I don't want to, you know, drip the place with too much humidity, you know, and overheat, overcool. Um, I mean, is it is it any different online? Are there any other hurdles that you guys encounter? Feel free to pipe in. Any hurdles you guys encounter when you do zoning? No, you guys are all pros. What's your... Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, also, there's. Uh, so Kyle just said, you know, he kind of harped on the the poor duct design. Um, you can cause a lot of noise if you don't have the right if the static pressure is going crazy. Because again, customers want comfort. They don't. They not only want to be hot or cold, okay, when they want it, but they also don't want to have a whistling noise going on <laughs> all night and every day. Right? So static pressure is absolutely an issue, and we're going to tackle that. Um, also, um, do what? Relief dampers. Relief dampers? Yep. Uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into the type of dampers, too, uh, to help counteract those static pressure issues. Um, air is sometimes a problem, too. What was that? Location of return air. The location of the return air. All those things are important with regards to ending up with a good system. Uh, you know, it's what start right ends right the important thing about zone control in fact take zone control out of the entire equation right now and you are designing a heating and air conditioning system for a specific application a new home or upgrading uh, an older home or even a light commercial job you know good duct design doing proper load calculations sizing the equipment right are all critical in making zoning work. Right. The, the other thing that I preach a lot about is zone control doesn't work for every application, uh, especially in, I see this in a lot in light commercial applications, but I could also speak residentially, where you don't have like load conditions. And remember, zoning involves one piece of equipment. And that piece of equipment, now I know you commercial guys, we, we, can, we have tricks of electric duct heaters and all this other stuff we can do. But typically, you, you are either going to heat or you're going to cool. But you can't do both at the same time. And the misconception was, and still is some, to some people, well, how come I can't get cooling in this zone and heating in this zone? <laughs> we got one piece of equipment. Yeah. Uh, it, we can't do that. Now we can prevent. Uh, we don't. We don't have. We can have a thermostat calling for heat and a thermostat calling for cooling. And nowadays, with microprocessors and the firmware right. that we can develop, uh, you know, we 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 uh, either allow through uh, the control algorithm, uh, <coughs> first call priority, uh, timeshare. We can do a lot of things. Uh, but this thermostat calls for heat. 
okay, we'll give that zone heating. If it, another thermostat calls for cooling, we have auto changeover capability. Right. But like load conditions are important. If you have a commercial building, you got a bunch of perimeter zones, and then you got this huge core area zone with equipment first, and then consider using zone control, forced air zoning for like load <coughs> areas, right. perimeter zones versus a big core area that you're not going to be able to zone anyway. Right. Uh, that's been attempted a few times over the years and it never works. Yeah. So you always have to look at proper sizing of equipment, proper ductwork design, um, and you know a lot of a lot of contractors make the statement, well, it's really not worth it. I'll just go ahead and put in another piece of equipment. Well, that piece of equipment, when you figure you're double, you're just duplicating everything. The pad. Including the cost. Two outdoor <laughs> condensing yeah. units, two air handlers, <laughs> two line sets, yeah. uh, two disconnects. Uh, the cost goes up. And do you make any more money doing that? Not really. Mm -mm. Uh, you can be more competitive putting in a zoning system where it will fit, where it will work, mm -hmm. uh, than trying to put in two pieces of equipment. Right. We even had some uh, participation online here. These are all great. Like Jim said, not enough returns. Okay. I experienced that at my house personally. You know, I'm sure if anybody deals with fixing the mistakes when the builders hire out a mechanical contractor, and they're like, look, do it as cheap as possible, cut as many corners as possible, because we're <laughs> all about getting that price down. And it shows a lot of the times with shoddy duck work and not enough returns. Phil, I had one return in my house. Is 3,300 square feet, and it was upstairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, one return, and it was a nightmare. Luckily, I had a contractor here, punched in some returns, got some zoning, fixed it immediately. Um, sometimes zones are too small. Okay. True. Uh, a, a, another issue with regards to some of the residential applications is bonus rooms. Mm -hmm. You got that bonus room over the garage. Why they ever put it there, I'll never know. But, you know, it's real pretty, and you got some carpet in there, and it's, you're going to make it into your uh, exercise room or the wife's studio or uh, the kids' playroom. Right. And, of course, you know, in the summer, uh, no matter if you got your air conditioning on full blast, and even without a, without a zoned house, you got 10 degrees difference between the downstairs and the upstairs. And now in a bonus room, you could have 20, 30 degrees difference. Yeah. Part of the reason is because those bonus rooms never have enough air moving into them. Right. Not enough ductwork. You know, typically they're built like a barn, you know. <laughs> right. You're banging your head into the side of the wall. Right. But, uh, and returns? No, there's no yep. returns. So that in itself creates a problem when we, we look at zoning. Can I zone that bonus room? Yeah, I probably can, but I may have to increase some ductwork. I may ha I definitely have to get some returns in there, right? Or undercut the door by six inches <laughs> to create to recreate some more airflow. Yeah, it, it can be done, but again, the load on a bonus room and you guys all seen them the garage bonus room yep. is is horrendous. Um, I'll be honest. I would rather just go put go ahead and put in a little mini split or a window shaker unit <laughs> than zone that. Right. That's just what I'm a straight shooter, guys. I just lost a job, but that, but I'd rather do <laughs> well, that. Well, this is over. All right, thanks, guys. Good night. Uh, because <laughs> it it can create nightmares. It's just yeah. a bad application. Yeah. The the load differences are so extreme. It's the same way with, you know, what type of house would I not zone? A glass one. <laughs> right. And and I've seen some custom homes that that's just about what they are. Yeah. They're big glass homes, huge windows. Uh, Hopefully they have some solar gradient <laughs> in the glass, but you know, you got tremendous sun loads or you yeah. have exterior influences on these homes. Vaulted ceilings, uh, you know, I walked into a, a home that uh, my wife and the bank could never afford, but you know, the ceilings were 23 feet high. Ish. And uh, it was really funny too, because it was one little return <laughs> in this huge, <laughs> yeah. big family room, you know, and I think, wow. Uh, gorgeous architecture, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but then the architect should have been shot because uh, <laughs> there was no way you were going to be able to effectively condition that home. That's right, and you the, got your carry license, right? So you could have done yeah. that. Good. So watch out, guy. <laughs> can you zone every home or every building? No. 
uh, you really have to look at uh, the load differences, right? Especially in light commercial and commercial applications, and uh, you know your best to look at them. If it's a large a a job, right? Maybe I need two pieces of equipment, but then each one of those pieces of equipment can be expanded with regards. We can zone those areas. Absolutely. I can Absolutely. have a master bedroom, uh, uh, or a downstairs. I can have a living room, family room, uh, a dining room, or whatever, a kitchen, but. You know, on the same area, I can zone every one of those. Yeah. Um, years ago, guys, where did we put the thermostat? What? Why did we do that? Hallway. Yep. We stuck it in the hallway. Everyone said hallway. One return. Well, my theory was it was all it was the shortest wire run to the air handler. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> that's just my theory. But you know, we don't live in the hallway. Nope. And, and then when you get out of bed at night, you had to walk down the hallway Ugh. and, you know, try it. Well, back in my day, those things didn't light up. You had to get the flashlight out and try to figure, you know. <laughs> uh, but that, that is what kind of started zoning. Yeah. You don't live in the hallway. Exactly. Why would you put the thermostat in the hallway? You know? Right. Or now you put it in a living room and you don't use the living room at all. You're, you use the family room. Uh, or the bonus room or whatever. So zone control <laughs> allows you to occupy, you know, all spaces and maintain the comfort level you want or to save energy in the event you use programmable thermostats. Mm -hmm. That's what saves energy. Yep. Zone control is not an energy saver. See, people are going to throw rocks at me. Boy, oh. I, uh, no, know, that's they, right. It says it depends. What's your rebuttal, Phil? Zone control isn't going to save energy. You don't sell zone control by itself to anyone and say, oh, you're going to save 30% on your energy bill. What saves energy is programmable thermostats, being able to schedule occupied and unoccupied zones. If you're not using the bedrooms during the day, set the thermostats back or set them up, you know, because you don't need to put conditioned air into that, those spaces at a comfort level that you would want right and vice versa you go to bed at night shut you know set back the living rooms or the family room or the bonus room yeah. that's what saves energy zone control is designed to create comfort the two-story homes that's the biggest issue right uh the the 10 degrees difference between the upstairs and the downstairs not being able to put enough <coughs> uh condition cooling in the upstairs right. during the summertime and you know the laws of physics are against us in the heating air conditioning industry <laughs> cooling drops and heat rises if it was the other way it would be pretty cool yes but it would we can't do that <laughs> phil i got some questions online yes. for you um and this actually you can chime in here because i'm actually curious too what extent do you the hvac contractors have in, in any involvement in duct design and placement in residential construction does anybody do duct design here? Do you have? Okay. Do you do custom homes or is it? No, I've went into houses where they had boilers or whatever. Boilers. Radiant heat and ceiling. Mm -hmm. Boilers and radiant heat, yep. And I've done duct systems and I've designed it to, for the load. Gotcha. Okay. So, I mean, there's typically, but you guys really aren't that involved. I mean, unless I know a lot of commercial contractors maybe work with the engineers, but really you guys don't have a say unless you are the new construction mechanical contractor. So you're, you're stuck. You know, on a commercial application, they have these engineers do it. They mm -hmm. either over-engineered or under-engineered. Mm -hmm. Yes, the duct work can be over-engineered. We run into that a lot, don't All we? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, like, what's, here's another question Trey uh, asked here. Is there a threshold or a minimum square footage where zoning isn't a viable option, just based on square footage? Yeah, a mobile home <laughs> probably wouldn't be... <laughs> yeah. uh, you could do it. <laughs> we had a contractor in South Carolina. He installed zone control in mobile homes. Nice. <laughs> hey, more power to him. Uh, you know, the, the, the dampers were underneath the, the mobile home. But whatever. Hey man, those double but, wise, they I mean, comfort yeah, too. You gotta, if you have a home that, let's say, is uh, 850, 1,200 square feet, you know, uh, a, a ranch home. Right. Uh, you could zone it and you could. You could enhance the comfort levels, but at the same time, it's probably uh, not 
real life is with regards to where where we zone homes at. Right. You know? Well, that was that was a good, look, lot of good information. I need to move along here. Um, another kind of hurdle or misconception is people say, you know, what damper do I use? You know, every is every damper the same? Does it matter? We had a question actually come in earlier um, asking the pros and cons of using a diffuser damper versus a damper at the takeoff. What's your uh, what's your take on that, Phil? Well, when we talk about diffusers, we're talking about these little wheels right. in our ceilings, and that's that's typically light commercial commercial yeah, applications. You, there, you don't sure. see these in a home <clears throat> usually. <laughs> um, is there an advantage to using a what what was I think the uh, the inquiry was diffuser damper versus putting a damper in uh, right off of the, the, the trunk onto the main branch. Right. Not really. Um, we have to keep in mind, though, that in most of the residential products that we sell for residential zoning, it's two position. In other right. words, that damper is either driven to the closed position or driven wide open. When we get into modulating systems, now we're talking about using a control algorithm that will basically modulate that damper. Right. So we have VAB diffusers that have a modulating ring. And so the diffuser neck has the actuator on it, has uh, uh, a linkage, and we're able to modulate this, this, uh, this ring to increase or decrease the amount of air going into the space. You can do the same thing with a standard diffuser and put a modulating damper anywhere in that branch run to that mm -hmm. diffuser. So uh, whether it's an advantage or not, I don't really see any advantage <coughs> other than the fact that it's what is specified typically by the engineer. Okay. Yes. I found that inside of them, you can sh open or shut them, and then they got louvers that you can adjust. I found those work better than anything I've ever used. So you're saying louvers work better? No, they're, they're, the louvers on the, like, like they're, the one you had on the desk, like for a floor, see how the yeah. louvers, you can adjust the louvers on some of them. Yes, you can. You can. They cost more, but they work better. You can actually convert the air in a better Real. And in, in a lot of commercial jobs where you're using VAV diffusers, um, the engineer will specify uh, which way he wants the air to th throw. So if you've got a diffuser up next to a wall, you put in, you put in uh, uh, these blocking vanes, basically, and he says, I only want a three-way throw or a two-way throw. Uh, this is really more involved in the commercial you know, environment rather than, than residential. But that's the only difference, JD, is, right. is but I can take a, a regular diffuser and I can put a two position <clears throat> damper behind it, does the same thing. Right. Um, because, but one thing we have to remember is that as I begin to modulate a damper, I have to understand that I'm going to get to a point where eventually I'm gonna start dropping air. Right. In other words, you get to a point where I'm not gonna be able to uh, get good stratification out of that diffuser. So there, the diffuser design is critical and the amount of air you have to push through that is critical. But if I have an open and closed damper, no big deal. It's either on or it's off. So yeah. differences in dampers. Yeah, um, we actually have some here. I mean, yeah. I was gonna ask you, and now we've got some three wire dampers here. Now, ver like your personal preference, like a two wire spring open power closed damper, versus a power open, power closed damper. I mean, is there any advantage to one or the other? I mean, obviously I think, you know, the, the spring open is nice if the power goes out because it's gonna go open. You know, you, want, you don't want it to fail in the closed position. But which one of these, I mean, do you prefer? Or is it pretty much the same? Uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> two wire dampers <clears throat> were the nightmare of the zoning industry. I see some nodding heads here, yeah. Um, and advancement in 
engineering and technology have greatly improved that design. But uh, I, was, I was there as a kid on the block when Ron and I experienced just incredible failures yeah. with dampers. We, just, we saw it all the time. And there were a couple reasons for this, that if you have a two-wire damper, and the concept was power the damper closed and allow it when the zone calls to spring return open. Well, what was used was just a, it was an impedance protected motor. In other words, it didn't need an end switch. It would just drive, close, stall itself, and sit there mm -hmm. all day. That didn't hurt anything. Right. But you had to have a spring that was strong enough so when you took the power off the motor, it could wind it open again. In yeah. other words, it, the spring actually pulled the damper against the damper blades. The springs weren't an integral part of the actuator. <laughs> they, <laughs> they put a sp spring on a damper blade and hooked it onto a, a, a nut and bolt or something. And so this thing would drive closed and it had to have enough torque to offset the torque of the, or the uh, torque of the spring. Right. And then you take the power off and the speed was not linear mm. because now this motor, by the time it got to the end, a full open position where it would hit its end stop, the motor was screaming. The gears were just winding like crazy. And then guess what happened? Bam! It came to an abrupt stop. And then things would center, gears would mm -hmm. break, and it was a disaster. Yeah. All of a sudden came along a company that made hot water valve, two position spring return hot water valve actuators. And they had a neat idea. They said, what we need to do is somehow or other uh, prevent this inertia from taking place. So the new design, that's not a two-wire, but the yeah, new design two of two-wire dampers today, two <clears throat> major improvements. Uh, an anti-backlash spring, which means that as that damper goes to the full open position and actually hits the mechanical stop, it can't go any further, mm -hmm. the inertia is absorbed by a, a backlash spring. So as the motor you know, it comes to a dead stop, but the motor is continued to allow to drive and it breaks itself slowly. Right. Another major advantage was we didn't like the way the speed would not maintain, a, you know, its, it's, uh, it's linear Here speed. Here we go. Two wire yeah, motor. Yeah, here's a two wire. Out of nowhere, off screen. Yeah, and you guys, <laughs> if you, I know you, if you buy dampers, you've seen these. But see, the spring's <clears throat> internal. It's all inside here. And this, ha this has uh, anti-backlash braking. But we didn't, still didn't like that speed problem, right? Because we had no way to slow this motor down. Mm -hmm. In other words, that return spring is now driving this blade, and it's going like crazy. And man, it hits. Well, we'd absorb the inertia, but at the same time, you could hear this. You could hear that damper when it was returning. You know, real high pitched noise. And of course, you amplify that through ductwork, and guess who gets mad? Right. Well. <laughs> And someone really got smart. Let me break this and I'll show you. Time for the air brake. Yeah. They designed an air brake. That was my nickname in basketball. It's air brake. Uh, now, this won't break. work with a, a hoot if you don't have this cap on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what this does, it creates enough resistance so as the damper now returns under spring force, it maintains its same speed. So it closes and opens basically at the same speed. So two-wire dampers have really improved. Have. Uh, you you, you kind of gave me a trick question. What is my preference? Yeah. I still like two-wire dampers. Wow. For okay. specific applications. Mm -hmm. But again, zone control has really revolutionized uh, it, it, with regards to where we started many years ago, it's really come along. Uh, bypass, we'll get into that, yeah, and we'll then I'll explain bypass. why I also like three-wire dampers. But that's power closed, spring return open, 24 volts, 
That's all you need, just yeah. two wires. And all our zoning panels, everybody's zoning panels will take a two wire damper. I right. don't know of one on the market that won't, other than proprietary type zoning. Right. We did have another question, and I think I thought you addressed this earlier. When, when you're zoning, uh, is the plenum design any different than a normal non-zoning system? No. If you were going, if you do good, uh, if you go, do good design work, okay, you and not even consider zoning, other than you got to access the duct work. Right. Uh, it's no different. Putting in a damper doesn't. Uh, if a damper is open, it doesn't. There, you don't even the the, the static pressure difference or resistance is so infinite you know infinite you don't right. it, it means nothing right so that's a big no okay moving right along we got another poll for you guys uh, we are actually transitioning into the bypass damper this is a very hot topic uh, in the zoning world because it's not always a fun thing to have to deal with uh, having to put in a bypass damper so on your phones or your tablets your smart devices are online the poll question is how difficult is it for you to install and balance a bypass damper? Now, I love these options here. Um, I can do it in my sleep, not that hard. I might need instructions. Well, that's three hours of my life. I'm not getting back. I need help. <laughs> and balancing a bypass damper is the fifth circle of hell. So those are our options. Uh, a little extreme there, but uh, I've, I've actually heard that with a bypass damper. Now, obviously, you know, over the years, there's been some legislation um, trying to get rid of bypass dampers because they're not energy uh, efficient. California. California. Was that Title 24? Yeah. And that, you know, that actually sprung the creation of the BZD damper. But we're going to get into all these options, like how do you overcome the bypass? How do you avoid using the bypass? And we actually sell a product here. We're not going to get too salesy tonight, but we do have a way to overcome the bypass without having to install it. Um, so we're just going to wait a little bit here. What do you, Phil, do you have zoning in your house, by the way? I, I haven't asked you this before. No. Oh, my gosh. I I'm live, crushed. I don't get paid enough money. I live in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> I can't zone my tent. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little too cold for a tent. Uh, it's just my spouse and I, and we have a small home, so we don't need zoning. Yeah. Besides, gotcha. I'm in the woods most of the time anyway. So. Yeah, Phil's never home. He's out hunting or <laughs> shooting targets or whatnot. Fishing. Fishing, yes, absolutely. We talked about that earlier. Important stuff. That's the, right. the very important stuff, exactly. Well, we actually, in my home, I was fortunate enough to beta test the first ever ESP system, and it's worked like a charm. No bypasses anywhere in that house, and my house is zoned. And there's, there's no noise issues, no overheating, no overcooling. Um, it's great. And like you mentioned earlier, our bedroom is right above the garage. There you go. And uh, so there's no, there's no load sharing issues with you know, killing the equipment of constantly pumping cold air up there. Um, even though I like it cold, my wife likes it a little hotter than uh, <laughs> I uh, prefer. But uh, that's, that's what we all overcome, right, with the spouse? And the temperature. Uh, okay, so the results are coming in. Do we have the results for that? Here we go. Yet? Okay, here we go. Uh, this is about what I've figured. So the leading answer there, what's up, man? Uh, the leading answer there is the I need instructions with 53%. Um, so that's kind of like you know about a bypass, but you really need a little bit of help. It's not like the fifth circle of hell, which 7% of you did say uh, <laughs> about dealing with a bypass. And trust me, I've heard it. Um, 20, I guess the second one was 28.2, not that hard. So we got some pros out there that know what they're doing. Uh, only 5.1 so they could do it in their sleep, Phil. Is that, which one of those answers surprises you? Um. None of them surprise me, but I think we'll we'll go to the 53.8 percent there. I yeah. need the ins I need some instructions. Right. Well, I think everybody, if if you're just new in zone con zoning, you, you need a little education with regards to properly installing a bypass damper. Mm -hmm. The big issue that I see today and had that has really come about in in you know the past several years or more is that. They basically don't give us enough space to put a bypass damper in. Right. 
I mean, you got uh, you got an upflow furnace or something, you know, and you, you <laughs> here's your main supply plenum, and you got three inches between that and your return plenum, um, and how do you put a bypass damper in? You know, I can't get that thing between them. Right. So, so just the uh, configuration of equipment today, you know, yeah. they want you to they want you to put. Uh, 10 tons of cooling in a five ton box. I mean, that, that's <laughs> that's what's happening. Um, it's the nature of the beast. Yep. Uh, the builder does not want to lose square footage for what we have to get done and do right in, in our industry. So we have this hurdle, how do I even get a bypass in? Right. Well, Years before bypass, true bypass, we used to have what they call dump zones. Hmm. Now energy was less expensive. <laughs> they had just dump it in the garage, dump it in the basement, you know, yeah. dump it under the house. In other words, you still had to maintain your static pressures. So they used to have what they called dump dampers, and we called them flapper dampers because they go bang, bang, bang. You know, they, <laughs> they, they didn't modulate, they didn't hold system static pressure, they just dump it, dump it, dump it. Right. And that drove people nuts. So uh, finally, uh, the barometric uh, bypass damper was developed. And it truly modulates. In other mm -hmm. words, it will hold its position based on maintaining proper static pressure. Uh, I have been in the field with a lot of contractors who said, you know, boy, we've got problems. We put the bypass in and the curtains are blowing off the wall or the windows and uh, we got noise issues and you found out that only because they didn't look at the instructions, they installed the bypass damper improperly. Mm -hmm. A bypass damper is nothing more than a basically a, a, a damper. It's got a right. blade in it with air seals, and it's got a counterweight. Well, if you were to install it the wrong way, it would go clunk and it would stay open all the time or it stay closed all the time, and it never works. Yeah. So it's very easy to determine. We have good instruction sheets show you how to install a bypass damper. But let's say you, were, you are able to install a bypass damper from a <coughs> supply, which moves the air back into the return. Yeah. So as the static pressure increases, it will relieve that pressure back into the return side of the system. So if your static pressure, regardless of zones opening and closing, is always maintained. Right. And I've been asked hundreds of times, yeah, but how do I, how do I set this thing up? How do I make it work? And I've heard, I mean, I've heard guys say, well, we take the smallest zone and we let it run and then we adjust this thing. No, 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 you don't ever want to do that. <laughs> what you do is you have all zone dampers in the open position, right. all zones. You turn your air handler on and these things have nothing more than, hey, they make great fishing weights, I'll tell you, but, <laughs> but they have these big clunky weights on them <laughs> and you got this big long post <clears throat> and I, we don't even have a bypass here, but anyway. You adjust these, and you adjust them, you, you know, the further, you, the closer you get to the shaft, the less resistance, and as soon as the blade just starts to flutter, you'll see it start to flutter, back it off a half an inch, lock right. it down, you're done. That's all you have to do with a barometric bypass damper. Yeah. If you can get it installed. <laughs> Yeah, and this is apparently a hot topic because we've had a ton of questions if pop up. If you can get it installed. Online. Um, first of all, thank you, Adam, for the shout out. Adam said, ESP, exclamation uh, mark, <laughs> the best I ever use. Okay, so thank you for that plug. Uh, Jerry has a question, and I was also going to ask this. He wants to know, do all zone systems need a bypass? Like, when is a bypass necessary? In a Not zone necessarily. Uh, if the ductwork <laughs> is slightly oversized, that doesn't hurt anything with a zoning system. If it's grossly undersized, then you, you are gonna have issues. Many, many times, a two zone system doesn't require bypass, providing that each zone represents a fairly 50-50 uh, split with regards to the CFM. Right. Uh, air noise, if you, if you have air noise, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, without having to put a bypass in, but I'm talking about a simple two-zone system. All dampers that, that Jackson Systems provides have minimum position adjustment. 
so that when I, I don't want to ruin this motor because you're not supposed to close these things, <laughs> but I can actually set a minimum position <clears throat> stop on this so that this damper will not completely close. And we even have on uh, we even have on the our uh, HD dampers uh, a calibration lever. It goes from like 10% to 100% full yeah. open, full close. But when we're closing that damper on a two-wire damper, I can set a stop so I can allow that zone to leak just slightly. Right. And many, many times, I'm not talking, this isn't a balancing damper, but many times we can bleed just enough air into non-calling zone and do it with both of them. Yeah. And as long as we don't have air noise, problem solved. Yeah. Okay. Because if you don't have air noise, your static pressure has an increase substantially. Um, if you've got a very small zone and a great big zone, then chances are, and let's say that small zone is that bonus room or whatever, then you're going to need some bypass. Right. I mean, what is it typically, if it can handle at least 25% of the load? If each zone can that... handle 25% of the total CFM in the yeah. system. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from one of our favorite online attendees, Constantino. He's here today. Thank you. Constantino, yeah, see, everybody knows Constantino. Um, he, he has a question about balancing the bypass damper, uh, and you kind of addressed this. Do you only go by static pressure, or do you account rise of temperature and pressure? No, just static pressure. Just static pressure, okay. Now, brings up another point, though. Let's say you have a, a zoning system, three zones, two zones, three zones, four zones, etc and you are using conventional bypass. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're in the cooling season and you're bypassing, let's say, 50% of the air back into the return, you're gonna start to super cool. Super and cool. eventually you're gonna end up freezing the coil. Mm. That's why limits built in to zoning systems where we have our own discharge air sensor, mm -hmm. and we have both, years ago we had to have two, we had, they were me electrical mechanical devices, today it's all solid state, but even uh, in conventional bypass, barometric bypass, or even electronic bypass dampers, the important thing is, is that we protect the equipment. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of zoning systems where the guy said, I don't need that discharge air sensor, and then they got a block of ice on their coil. <laughs> Because what we don't want to do is freeze a coil, or we don't want to trip on safety limits. And most of the equipment today, and you guys can confirm this, is like three strikes and you're out, and then they're calling you at two in the morning to come out there to reset the furnace. Right. And yet you can't figure out why it tripped in the first place. It was because it was zoned, and they didn't put a, uh, a high-low limit protection in, in from the zoning panel to the discharge air and it tripped on its safety limit. Hmm. And today what we're able to do is we have adjustable high limits and, and even adjustable low limits on some of our panels, but most of them are fixed. Yeah. And we look at air temperature, so we have to do the math with regards to, we trip typically at 46 degree discharge air on low limit so that we're not frosting or freezing a coil. <coughs> and then on high limit, depending on the equipment, whether it's heat pump or gas, electric, uh, we can adjust those limits. Yeah. But we always want to keep our safety, our limits below the safety limits of the equipment. Or you just got headaches. So yeah. always use discharge air sensors with zoning. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and because that's important with bypass. Now, today, you don't even need a bypass damper. Right, exactly, exactly. And part of the reason for that is not only the installation time, even though we sell lots of bypass dampers, right. conventional bypass dampers, but the fact is is that I don't want my furnace tripping. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be cutting the compressor off because I, I went below the low limit setting, Right. let the air handler run, go into time delays so I don't short cycle the equipment, and you know, I don't want this short cycling, you know, on and off and on and off. don't want to say short cycling but because we have built-in time delays, but the fact right. is I'm not achieving set point because I'm tripping on low limit because I'm bypassing a lot of air. Right. So 
How do we get rid of that? Well, we get rid of the bypass damper altogether. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna tackle that here too. So, uh, any questions, by the way, in house here or online before we move on to the next myth that we're gonna bust, Bill? Who's that, that we got another myth. We got another myth. <laughs> There's many myths in this uh, presentation. There's actually this <coughs> is two of four. We got uh, two more after this one. So, um, this is more of kind of the diagnosing side of it, like. A lot of contractors think it's too hard to pinpoint a problem when you have a zoning system uh, involved in the home. Okay, is that true or false? How, is, is it too hard to diagnose when you have a zoning system? Uh, it can be if it was not installed properly. Okay. Now, here, what I mean by installation. Okay. You know, over here, this is a six zone panel. It's a universal panel. We saw a lot of these. And it can be expanded up to 12 zones. Right. But good for residential and also good for commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, work with heat pump, heat cool, uh, multi-stage, dual fuel, you know, flip the switches and you set it up that way. But keep in mind that I have to run, let's say I have a six zone system. I'm running six thermostat wires to this panel. Mm -hmm. I'm outputting to six, at least six zone dampers. And if I don't tag my wires, and I'm the poor guy that's got to land all this stuff, and I just got this big spaghetti mess coming down through the <laughs> wall or whatever, right. what goes to what? Yeah. And it's amazing how many times I get calls through tech support, your panel doesn't work. Zone one is calling, and zone one damper is closed, and zone two damper is open. You're, you're something wrong with your logic. And uh, I don't laugh at them, but I know exactly <laughs> what happened. Things got mismatched. Yeah. Now, you do that a lot. Well, it takes a lot of time because what we have to go through is a process of elimination, but usually we can fix it real quick. Right. Home run wiring. Two competitive arguments all the time about zone control. Daisy chain, which means you're linking a damper to uh, a thermostat and it's linked to something else and linked to something else and same daisy chain wiring. In other words, oh, I just got to run one daisy chain. And typically in uh, uh, more sophisticated systems, daisy chain involves communications. Right. That's where you get a device, a, ne a number or a name, right? That's daisy where you get a chain. device or number name? Like the proprietary kind of stuff? Systems? Not necessarily, uh, but but there are zoning companies out there that use daisy chain zoning. And in, in other words, they're not using a, uh, they're not using a logic panel. Uh, they might have a master controller, and that master controller is daisy chained or linked out to the other various components in the system: uh, wall sensors, uh, actuators, bypass dampers, etc. To diagnose a, a daisy chain system, and especially if, if they're not the type that you can diagnose using uh, software or computer interface with them, becomes very, very difficult because you don't, you don't know where the break is in the chain, in the link. Yeah. And we have, Jackson Systems has always believed in what we call home run wiring. You know, and the guys say, man, I got to run all that wire to this thing, to this box here, I got to run six runs of thermostat wire, six runs of damper wire, and of course output to the equipment. But when it comes to diagnostics, everything, any issue you have with a zoning system can be <coughs> diagnosed right here. Yep. You don't need to be running up and down the stairs. <laughs> You don't need, you know, from the second floor to the basement, wait right. a minute, you know, I, because we can begin at this panel and work out, go outward. Mm -hmm. uh, so many times, that is brand new thermostat wire, that's brand new wire, there's nothing wrong with that wire. Well, there wasn't until a guy shot a staple through it, you know. <laughs> And you wonder why it's blowing fuses or you got a short here and there. Right. Um, it takes very little time to do diagnostics on a home run system. Everything's fuse protected. 
We use LED lights yeah. to confirm relays making or, you know, breaking, whatever. Uh, some of it, we even use an LCD display. Uh, it's this, this particular panel, it isn't giving you any diagnostic codes. Right. Uh, we're not that sophisticated. It I mean, those are it, out there, though. It, but well, it's I've had a, I had a guy said, "Well, I think there's something wrong because the light's blinking. Looks like it blinks three times real quick and then blinks two times slower." And I said, "No, it's not giving you any code. It just blinks. It's telling you that the microprocessor is working. It's, yeah. it's talking." But <laughs> LED lighting, great tool mm -hmm. for diagnostics. You know, oh, I got 24 volt power. Uh, zone uh, two, three, and four are open. Uh, you know, uh, I'm in this mode of operation. I'm in heat. I'm in cool. I'm in emergency heat. There's all. I mean, it, we use LEDs to provide uh, a quick visual uh, diagnostics. You know, with regards to what's going on in the panel. Right. Now, everybody has one of these. Maybe That's what not. I was going to lead into. You said great tools. What kind of tools do we need? Everybody's Phil? got a multimeter. <laughs> Everybody needs to have one of these screwdrivers, the ones that fit those little terminal blocks, <laughs> those three inch wide bladed screwdrivers, they're not gonna do anything. Nope. Gotta have that. If you push hard enough on it. And if, if you don't you have a hunk hard, of thermostat yeah. wire and you're <laughs> really sophisticated, get yourself some jumper wires. These are magnetic, I love them. But thermostat wire works just as good. And uh, in fact, I had a guy once, I, he, he said, I, there isn't a wire laying around this place. And I said, well, what, what do you got? You got anything? And he said, well, I don't have any jumper wires. And I, he, uh, we made a jumper out of a, clo a clothes hanger, you know, just something to huh. create a dead short with. Uh, you can do a lot of things. Now, when you call technical service, because we're here to support issues, uh, either misunderstandings or this thing isn't working, and what, how can we quickly mm -hmm. diagnose what the problem is. Don't leave that in your truck. You know, don't leave that in your truck. Oh, uh, wait a minute, he's on the third floor, now he's gonna walk down a truck and get that. Have that with you. <laughs> Have this little screwdriver with you. Have a jumper wire. Three things, oh, plus a good light. Yeah, yeah. right. Because uh, obviously, there you go. Most, <laughs> of the, most of the equipment rooms, unless they're really high end, uh, yeah, you're lucky if you can see it all, and they usually, uh, if you, especially if you're going out and uh, diagnosing a system that was installed by others, <laughs> <laughs> you 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 may you may need a lot of light to, uh, because you got to have some light to see what's going on. That's all we need to diagnose this system, because we're going to check inputs and outputs. And through the process of elimination, and even on this six zone panel, it would take less than five minutes. Hmm. I've been able to walk guys through, through these, providing they listen, and they don't argue. And it, from square one, we say, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna disconnect every hot wire going to stats, zone dampers or you know common wires going to zone that we're going to take everything out of the loop mm -hmm. now we're going to look at the panel and is the panel functioning you know well i got 24 volt power and when you disconnect thermostats and zone dampers the leds will tell you those zone dampers should be all powered open or be in the open position so leds immediately we use that over the phone which is great because i i, I see what's going on mm -hmm. Uh, is it configured properly? You know, oh, you're using a heat pump, you got a switch set for heat, cool, no wonder it's not working properly. You can very quickly diagnose, just through process of elimination, what's going on. Well, I keep blowing these fuses, I keep blowing these fuses. All right, yeah, you're gonna probably blow a couple more before it's over, but we're <laughs> gonna find out why the fuses are blowing. And <coughs> typically, it's not the 24 volt input, Unless some guy, well, if he wires his line bolt, he's just going to definitely blow up. Which we've but, seen. But uh, <laughs> it, rarely is there dead short on yeah. the input, the 24-volt input. Now, providing that you're using a separate transformer, and we always, that's gospel to us, mm -hmm. don't use the equipment transformer. We don't know what the VA rating is, and 
we don't even want to get involved with that equipment transfer. Right. So through process of elimination can very quickly determine where the issue is. And a lot of times it is in the wire from the thermostat to the panel or in the wire from the zone damper to the panel. Right. Now, there can be mismatch wiring, but I find that in in 90% of the issues that come in, you know, this, I, I'm blowing fuses or I can't get zone one to call. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you mean you can't get zone one to call? Well, it's calling for cooling, but the compressor isn't on, the LED isn't lit for compressor, and all the zone dampers are open. So the first thing we do is, well, we start hooking these thermostats back up, and they're the hot wire, and I said, okay, let's get zone one to call for something. Leave the equipment disconnected. I don't want to short cycle anything. This panel is going to tell me what's going to go happen. Right. And he said, yeah, it's calling for cooling. And how do we know that? You take your AC voltmeter, and you set it on AC, and you go across common and whatever that call input call is. Why? And you see 26 volts. Okay, thermostat's working. But usually that isn't the case. <laughs> right. Because if it was inputting and providing the microprocessor hasn't been destroyed or didn't get hit by lightning because right. most of the components are all solid state, it, if they do fail, they fail, and we replace the board under warranty. But that is typically where we see the issues, miswiring or dead shorts and wires. And sometimes he said, well, the thermostat's calling, but you're not getting 24 volts here at the panel. Yeah. So if you're not getting it here at the panel, all right, it's either the wire or you got miswiring at the sub base <laughs> or the thermostat is configured wrong. But it's very, very easy, and it doesn't take a lot of time on the tech's, uh, uh, you know, side. Right. If he calls us, when the tech calls us, and many, many zoning companies provide this service. I'm not saying we're the only ones. We're just better than they are. Right. But, but when they call us, <laughs> we answer the phone, and we, our goal is get off that job. We right. want to get the problem fixed. We will help you fix the problem. We'll resolve the issue, and we want you to get in that truck and go to your next job. Because the more time you spend screwing around with a zoning system uh, on callbacks or whatever it might be, the less money you make, right. the less money your company makes. Right. So zone control is easy <clears throat> to diagnose. Very simple. Phil, I had a question from Adam who... Yes. Praise the ESP system. This is kind of an interesting question. He said, "Have you have you talked to IO? So you have some input with their design. Yeah. Have you ever considered talking to them about making a see-through panel for the six-zone panel, like the cover, make it see-through? Is there an advantage to that? No. I know on the yeah, back th of ours. A, no, there's a disadvantage to it. There is. Mm -hmm. What's the disadvantage to having a clear zoning panel? I'll, the homeowner. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say." Homeowner. Those lights aren't for homeowners. Right. Those are lights are for the contractor. Yeah. The tech. I mean, we, we have enough we have enough problems <laughs> with the end user, I should say that word politically <laughs> correct, I guess. Look staring at a thermostat. And what are they comparing it to? Uh, the mercury thermometer they found in the kitchen and they're watching it. And then they're calling you up and saying, ah, this thing's off. We're not comfortable. You mm -hmm. couldn't tell a difference between one degree and two degrees, let alone, but they're watching that thing all the time. Mm -hmm. Now let's give them 100 lights and let them look at those. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Like your question, but no, we're not going to do <laughs> right. it. Right. <laughs> and here's another, real quick, before we move to the next myth. Um, is there a better design for a zoning system? I mean, obviously, to, to diagnose an issue, obviously, it's hard to get to a damper if it's buried, but you know, below uh, concrete, or if it's mm -hmm. it's impossible to get to. But what's the typical, ideal kind of setup to be able to diagnose an issue for a zoning? Well, system? first of all, you want to be able to access everything. Yeah. 
and, and unfortunately, you know, I've seen this happen. The job was installed, and the dampers were installed, let's say, in a basement that wasn't uh, a finished basement, mm -hmm. but, you know, you could access everything. The panel, the dampers, uh, obviously thermostats are run up through walls and stuff, but at the same time, uh, the wire was pulled, and hopefully, you know, you got an extra wire in the wall. Uh, <laughs> that, that's something I, I, I preach all the time. Uh, you know, if the job needs 18.4, put 18.6 <clears throat> in, because one of these days you're going to need that extra wire, <laughs> especially right. when, when the guy shot a staple through, you know. Or what? Or technology change. Yeah. Ah, Wi-Fi, you know, and all this stuff, and wi wireless thermostats. Yep. I mean, all that improves, uh, especially in retrofit, you know, the, your ability to pull wire. Years ago, a guy here, I won't mention his name, a contractor here in Indianapolis who Ron Jackson personally preached to for probably 24 hours, and became an <laughs> avid believer in zoning. Mm -hmm. But he did something that was really smart. Uh, he was involved in new construction, so they pulled the wire to the upstairs. He put, he put knockouts in the, in the uh, ductwork to slide a damper in. Nice. Uh, they had everything set up, and then he put his big old sign on the air handler that says, uh, when you're tired of uh, being uncomfortable in your home, call us about zoning. The little amount of extra labor that he went through when the homes were under construction, <laughs> three out of four homes got converted to zone control. And of course, the change out was so fast. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they take a plate off the duct, slam the damper in, you know, wire the thermostat up, hook everything up to the panel, and bingo, he was on and running. And wow. he was very profitable. But he was, that was good marketing, you know, on his yeah. part. Uh, I wish everybody would do that. No kidding. No kidding. All right. So we're going to, any questions uh, so far online, in person? No, I know there's a lot of CO2 going around, so stay with us. Got a lot of people breathing in here. There's food in the back too, so uh, if you're hungry. Yeah, that helps. Um, Phil, only, this is another kind of pushback I get when I talk to contractors. We kind of alluded to it with like the mobile homes, but only a few types of homes <coughs> can be zoned. Uh, emphasis on a few types of homes. No, most homes can be zoned. Okay. Yes. Providing you can access the ductwork. Right. Um, in, in, in that the ductwork is uh, designed properly so you <coughs> can move air. You know, in a lot of the real older homes um, where zoning can be a real uh, enhancement uh, you, not always can you just put one damper you know in a main uh, trunk line right uh, that's why we have retro dampers and uh, whereby you may have four five six branch runs serving one big area well you got a zone you got to put dampers in every one of those branch runs so we have retro dampers makes it life a little easier right uh, rather than sticking in, you know, uh, a regular uh, round damper, we can put a retro damper in. Uh, and that's why they were designed. Uh, but you can zone just about anything. Okay. Now, like I said, <coughs> glass houses. Uh, Vaulted ceilings, those. right. Uh, or in light commercial jobs where they want to zone the, uh, you know, car dealership, whatever it might be. I don't want to zone all the offices. Uh, they also want to uh, at, take that same heating air conditioning system and provide conditioned air to their server room. <laughs> and then they wonder why they're, <laughs> they're burning stuff up. Right. Opposite loads. Yep. And it can't keep up. Because everything you gain and you heat, you lose in cooling and vice versa. And it's bang, 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 back and forth. Now, that's, I think, a comment about, well, you, uh, you wear the equipment out. Uh, traditionally, zoning doesn't wear equipment out. Bad application will wear equipment out. Yeah. And if you're constantly changing over all the time, you're going after cooling call and you're going after heating call and you're going right back and forth, yeah, that can put wear and tear on equipment. Yeah. Gotcha. Zone control doesn't. Travis, online, he real quick wanted you to go back over uh, why a zone board requires a separate transformer. Just real quick, cover that. I know we. Well, 
Thermostats require little VA, but, but they do require VA. Our, the zoning panel itself requires a specific amount of VA. Mm -hmm. And zone dampers, depending on the type of dampers, can require as much as 10 VA each. So if I have a six zone system, I need a 75 VA transformer. You guys tell me, but I don't see very many 75 VA transformers in an air handler. And if you go ahead and try to use that transformer, oh, you could probably get away with it, but it isn't going to last. <laughs> you know, it'll go kapoop, or yeah. you'll, you'll be blowing fuses like crazy. So by using a separate transformer, and again, when uh, our customers call in and they, they want a quote on a zoning system, and we know what type of dampers they want to use. Now, one advantage to a three-wire damper, uh, this thing pulls less than two VA. Right. It, no end switches, you know, it's impedance protected, but, you know, it's got a, gal 18 inch pounds of torque. Right. Uh, these are Bulimo. We, we love the company and uh, they make a good actuator. But this little culprit here, that pulls 11 <laughs> VA. It's a big difference. Yeah, so if I have a three zone system, you know, 11 VA each, just for the damper, mm -hmm. and I use try to use the equipment transformer, I can get myself in trouble. Right. So we always recommend use a separate transformer. We're not talking huge investments, uh, you know, in, in the additional amount of money that it takes. And we have multi-taps, so you can get, you know, you can get uh, 120, 240, 208, whatever. Most of our transformers are multi-tap. So you can get your primary power from just about anything. Gotcha. And we have another question online. Um, Adam, again, who loves ESP, we appreciate it. Um, he wanted to know, can the ESP panel with display have firmware updated in the field? Not at this time. Not at this time. No. Okay. Gotcha. Um, also, I wanted to run through, because there's, there's other types of zoning out there. Um, if we run into a situation that might be difficult for conventional, I mean, we have uh, standalone, pneumatics, uh, equipment integrated. As far as which, which do you feel is the best option when you can't get to the ductwork, um, you've got a glass house, vaulted ceilings. Can you still overcome that with other options like zoning with multiple pieces of equipment? Well, true. Uh, multiple pieces of equipment you know it's not it's they're not dead that sometimes that's the only way you can actually provide good comfort levels or conditioned air in 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 zones like uh like a, we were talking you know perimeter zone and a core area mm -hmm. uh the loads are different um southwest exposures things like that now the type of systems out there typically they're all uh, microprocessor based today we started out with relays and diode relay <coughs> logic. And there isn't anything you can't do with a relay. Uh, I could probably, I could use relay logic and build that board right there. Of course, it'd be big as a car. It would be huge. <laughs> right. It's kind of what happened in the computer industry. Yeah. Remember the first big main? Oh, right? yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. They, they were behemoth things and mm -hmm. they didn't, you know, they didn't do squat. More yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, your smartphone has more power yeah, in it than watch uh, has more. sending yeah. a man to the moon, you know. <laughs> uh, so so a technology has improved zoning, but the type of zoning system depends on the type of application. For example, standalone zoning. We call it standalone because the zone damper, which is being controlled by a thermostat or a, or a temperature controller, whether it's modulating or two position, doesn't control the equipment. Well, thus, a standalone zoning system, if it can't control the equipment, all it can do is this. It can prevent overheating or overcooling of that zone. Mm -hmm. But if it's too cold in that zone and that thermostat needs heat, you're not going to get it. It all depends on the controlling thermostat that's, that's uh, running the equipment. So where we see standalone zoning used is in maybe a small office connected to a larger office, uh, right. the receptionist or whatever. She's always too cold because the boss has it cranked down. He's in the 
the uh, southwest exposure or something. He's got the AC crank way down. He's got the control of the equipment, mm -hmm. and the other poor individual is freezing. Well, standalone zoning solves that problem. But I wouldn't use, you know, standalone zoning in a home unless no. you have that issue where you're overcooling or overheating a space, and typically that's not the way it works. Mother-in-law suite. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, we just, <laughs> I just close her registers. <laughs> Just um, close the wrench. <laughs> well, this isn't that I don't like my mother. <laughs> uh, you did uh, you did a zone one in your house to make it, her happy in in your bedroom. And, and if it's an overcooling, oh, wow. overheating situation, that's how it works. Yeah, this is electronic zoning. We call it elect electronic. Um, it's all solid state today, but it could, you know, it, electronic was relay logic, diode relay logic, it, it, it all, now we use microprocessors and we can do cooler things. And then you have electro pneumatic zoning. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, it just involves two, uh, two elements, electronics, like this zoning panel, yeah. or similar, but the damper, what we call a damper, is now a pneumatic actuator. And that pneumatic actuator, whether it's got a blade on it or whether it's an inflatable. Uh, yeah, it's right there. We, we've seen them. Uh, is controlled by a pump, an air pump. So you got electronics. Now you combine that with, elect, you know, you with pneumatics. You want to pull that up there, Phil? What's we that? Got one right there. Oh, yeah, look at this thing. <laughs> this is really cool. Here, blow on that. Look. <laughs> um, so, so this thing, uh, you know, put put pressure on it, and uh, or put a vacuum on it, it go, or it goes closed. That's I think that's Ooh, the way it is. There's that is this dusty. is open. Yeah, that is dusty. It is weird. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so we're we're putting a vacuum on it, or we're putting pressure on it, and you're using. Uh, a fish tank pump or whatever they they use it's not very big <laughs> i know i'm being a little facetious and you use pneumatic tubing and do they work yeah they work now down in texas and in the southern parts of the country uh, inflatable dampers were very very popular the bladder dampers is that what yes. you're talking about yeah and the reason why was because they would have a attic air handler and they have a big plenum box with what we called uh, octopus takeoffs. She's, they would have these things running everywhere. <coughs> yep. Well, they'd stuff one of those things in there, less expensive than putting in, you know, right. uh, metal uh, dampers with actuators, and they worked. And that was the whole thing. They did work. Hmm. Uh, we don't see a lot of that in the Midwest, but, you know, those applications still exist. Uh, zone control, whether it's true electronic, like what we provide, or if it's electro pneumatic, uh, they work. And they work based on the same uh, guidelines that we as a company use and most of the reputable zoning <coughs> companies in, in the country use. Good design, size the equipment right, make sure you can access the ductwork so mm -hmm. you can zone it properly. Uh, use the proper uh, zoning panels, the proper thermostats, you know, uh, do you want to save energy? Use programmable thermostats. Do you care? You just want comfort? Okay, use any kind of thermostat as long as it's compatible with the equipment. And uh, zone control will function properly. Gotcha. Use bad design and uh, don't, don't abide by the rules of good HVAC design then uh, you're asking for trouble and you will become disgruntled and you'll say i'll never stuck another one of these uh, panels in again <laughs> but if if you what again what's done right ends right and zone control is a multi multi-million dollar industry mm -hmm. now one one zoning system i didn't talk about is what we call proprietary zoning we do not, uh, at this time, affiliate ourselves with any specific OEM manufacturer. Yeah. 
and typically it's the, the equipment manufacturer <coughs> who elects to create a proprietary system. Uh, you have you have train, uh, you have ream, carrier, uh, you have Bryant, carrier Bryant, you know the Lennox. infinity, the evolution, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with those systems, other than they are extremely expensive. Real quick, Very does anybody expensive. install those? Do we have any carrier dealers, or you guys use the iComfort at all, or any of the proprietary systems out here? No. Okay. And, Sorry, go ahead, and some of these systems when we talk about proprietary is they're actually communicating through the controller to the equipment. And they can do some really neat things. They can vary the fan speed uh, so that you can eliminate bypasses uh, or greatly reduce it mm -hmm. because they see what zones are calling or how much you know a zone damper is open and, and, and how many are closed. And they can vary the fan speed. We can do, we can do similar things, but ours is not a proprietary zoning panel. If you have a uh, an infinity thermostat, you're not going to be able to wire it into this thing uh, right. and make it work. Uh, if you use a, a true uh, infinity or evolution system, then that's a proprietary system. If any piece of equipment on the market will take a conventional thermostat input, you know, dry contacts, YWRG and O or B, if it's heat pump, then our zoning control systems will work with them, every one of them. Right. And honestly, I'm noticing a lot less of the proprietary zoning systems based on my personal experience because now the consumers with everything available online and reading reviews, watching YouTube videos, people see cool stuff and they want cool stuff. Nobody wants to be told, if you want this, you can only use this stat, you can only use this zone board, and they want you to they force you to play in that sandbox. Well, that's not how the market is no. really going now, especially for millennials who see cool Wi-Fi stats. You know, they're buying homes. 40% of them, I believe, all you know, people buying homes are millennials right now, and they want to be able to pick out the thermostat they want. So we're seeing a decline in those two. And it works great with the iPhone. It does. It does. So and, and we're we're <laughs> you know we're part of this industry, and we uh, will continue to add to our product line, and we will follow the consumer path. Mm -hmm. uh, we will soon have a Wi-Fi interface for zoning panels. Uh, it's it's important, uh, and I'm not talking about a communicating to a thermostat but actually communicating to the entire system to be able to be able to, to be able yeah. to see everything that's going mm -hmm. on not just a thermostat wi-fi controller now, is that going to affect the uh, consumer with all the lights bill is that going to affect the consumer with all the lights bill no because we're not putting clear plexiglass on there it's going <laughs> to cover it up and we have to put if we have to put a lock on it and give you the key we'll do that too uh, <laughs> What the consumer is going to see is all this pretty stuff on a, you know, an iPhone or yeah. laptop. Which is the new thermostat. This is this is the new thermostat. Now, I know, I know you said it. we can't talk about ESP, but I'm going to. Okay, uh, go for do it. Do we have time? Well, yeah, real quick. I did have a question on it. We've got one more myth right, I want to get to because we are running short of time. Right. Um, how do you personally feel about, this kind of harps to what we were talking about earlier, zoning individual bedrooms? I mean, I was going to answer that. To me, I, I think of the home with individual bedrooms, if you have like three or four or even five bedrooms all with their own thermostat, I look at it like an office. Everybody's got their own preference and it's going to be an absolute nightmare uh, giving people that much control, especially if you got teenagers, right? What do you feel about putting a thermostat in every single bedroom in the home? Get the ductwork laid out properly. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why you couldn't do it. Okay. And, and again, depending on the application, you have a guest room. Yeah. And uh, like you say, you know, I like it cooler. Maybe your guests want it warmer. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a nursery or, or yep. you know, a nursery. And you definitely want it to be a little warmer mm -hmm. in that room rather than, you know, but you, you don't want it that hot in your master bedroom. Uh, again, it's all the application and what the end user wants. Because, yeah, you zone every room in a house, basically. Uh, it all boils down to affordability, and uh, you know some people just like lots of chrome on their cars and doesn't really serve <laughs> anything. Right. Uh, 
But if that's what they want, you can do it. Absolutely. You know, as long as you can get to that ductwork. Yeah. That's the important thing. That's now, key. it's not always the contractor's fault. Up here in uh, what I call the wealth area, you know, 164th and further north where the homes are so big, you know. Uh, oh, I, yes. Yeah. They're as big as our building here. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they install zoning. Zoning's great. But, you know, this is, electro, this is an electromechanical device, a zone damper. It, it can fail, and they, they do fail. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they're not 100%. These things are, you know, the, you can, these motors are rated to cycle millions of times, but <coughs> you can fail. Or a wire can break, or something can happen. Great. And what happens is they install all this stuff, and then the homeowner, in their great wisdom, <laughs> finishes the basement, and I'm not talking drop ceiling, I'm talking textured ceilings. <laughs> totally finished the basement. A uh, very famous talk show host in Chicago had a beautiful uh, condominium on Lakeshore Drive. I won't mention her name, but I tell you what, she's one of the richest women <laughs> in the country. I think her name starts with an O. Yeah, that well, mean? anyway. Oh, I'm, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and it happened to be a Jackson system zoning system was installed. Really? Yeah, well, we yeah. found out it was. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. Now, the dampers were above the ceiling, you know, condo type deal, penthouse, whatever. <laughs> and then they sheetrocked and textured, plastered wow. the whole nine yards, and dampers failed. Hmm. And uh, she was informed that... Uh, we're going to have to cut holes in this <laughs> and put access hatches in. Yeah. Uh, Somebody was not getting a free car that no. day. Uh, they, for sure. they were very upset about that. <laughs> it can happen. Yeah. And, and uh, so that's exactly what they did. And I guess they had an architect come in and decide exactly how they were going to cut these things and how what kind of molding they were going to finish them with. Oh, but they had to be able to get to the dampers. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad we've kind of been moving towards this last myth buster here. We've been talking about proprietary systems. We've been talking about, you were gonna talk about the ESP. Yeah. Um, what I often get when I talk about zoning is either zoning with two pieces of equipment or proprietary zoning is the only way to do it. It's always gonna be better, end of story, period. I know what I'm talking about, true or false, Phil? False. And why? Proprietary zoning costs more money. Mm -hmm. So it is for the few, not mm -hmm. the many. And two pieces of equipment cost more money for the end user and less profit for the contractor. Now, usually the conception is if you sell more pieces of equipment, you make more money. But there's, it gets pretty cutthroat out there, right, when you guys are selling Margins equipment? Margins are pretty tight on equipment. Manufacturers want to sell their boxes. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whether you're uh, loyal to whatever brand out there, uh, the builders are shopping. They're, they're shopping everybody. Mm -hmm. And Ron Jackson told me this today. And he, he believes it, I believe it. I can put in a zone control for, system for less money and make more profit than putting in two pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. and got some confirmation here. That if it sense. were a two-zone system, uh, uh, just a, a typical two-story home, which we see a lot of this in the South. I mean, we for years, that's, you had two condensing units, two air handlers, you know, the whole nine yards. Thermostat up, <laughs> yeah, thermostat at the top of the stairway and a thermostat <laughs> at the bottom of the stairway, right? Worst place to put a thermostat, right. but that's how it was done. And zoning a home, you know, guys said, well, I've, I've got uh, three tons downstairs and i got a two-ton unit for the upstairs because it's a little smaller doesn't matter that equipment costs more money for the for the end user the right. product unless you're just gouging people <laughs> and you can go in and be more competitive by selling one piece of equipment sized properly and zoning at home and walk away with a lot more money hmm. and I will believe that until I leave this industry and JD I got a lot of years left here that's what I like to hear well, at least a couple <laughs> <laughs> What about, uh, we got another question online from Chris. 
He's asking about two-stage equipment. Does that drastically improve zoning or sure it does. efficiency wise or comfort wise? Absolutely. Yeah, the more stages of equipment you have, the, the more efficient your system is. And when you get into larger applications, we have tricks on our zoning panels where we have what we call capacity control so that we can select the minimum number of zones required to bring on a second stage. So uh, regardless what the end user does, because end users, as we all know, think a thermostat works like the accelerator on their automobile. <laughs> the further I turn it or the harder I push it, the faster it's going to get there. Right. It doesn't. We know that. But the end user doesn't. So to prevent wasting energy or by having to, having to you know, quit tripping on limits, right. we can selectively say a minimum number of zones are required to be calling in the same mode before we will even allow a second stage to come on. And that's pretty neat. Now I can have a small zone, and I don't care where they set their thermostat up. I will not bring on a second stage until two, three, four, whatever you select, right. zones are calling. And then we'll let second stage come on if at least one of those zones is calling for second stage. So two-stage equipment, <clears throat> the more stages you have, the more efficient zoning becomes. And the better it works. Right. Now, a lot of guys say, well, uh, I don't want to, I got a two-stage uh, gas furnace and I only got a single-stage thermostat. Big deal. They all upstage. I, do, does anyone know of one that doesn't? They all have 10-minute upstaging, you know. Hmm. I only use a single-stage thermostat in my home. I got a two-stage gas furnace. Really? Yeah. I just let the furnace do it. 10 minutes is a great number. I mean, it's a perfect time. <laughs> And if I haven't satisfied the call in two minutes, yeah. I need second stage or right. high flame. So, yes, staging does okay. more stages, the better the system will work. Guys, any questions on proprietary systems or, you know, what can work with what as far as inter interchanging? I do know um, that I think it's Lennox. It's either Lennox or Goodman had a proprietary system, and they're, they're also now opening that sandbox a little bit um, so because i think it was only ewc that used to be able to work with them but i well from what I, i've heard and, and we don't know up. we don't know the specifics uh, that they they have a proprietary system mm -hmm. and in which i believe uh, it may be open protocol in other words we could have access to it but um the show's not over and we're going to sit back and see what happens. Awesome. Uh, it's not that we couldn't involve ourselves in that, but um, it may it may be that it becomes defunct. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not going to we're not going to invest a lot of money <coughs> in a proprietary system. Right. Um, 80, 85 percent of all zone control systems installed today are used with conventional equipment. That's good to know. Very cool. Okay, so we're, we're about to wind up here, guys, unless you have any questions moving forward. I do have some reminders. Um, this recording will be up on the Jackson Systems website uh, within 48 hours. We have an on-demand section. Um, if you go to the Jackson page, it's under, I think, uh, tools or something, and then or contractor tools and on-demand. You can navigate through there. There's tons of trainings on there, including Nate certified classes uh, yeah. <laughs> on there as well. I think we've got a White Rogers combustion one still out there uh, available. And uh, also our spring training season is coming up soon. So we're going to have some more uh, manufacturers come through. We're going to talk about some more topics. We'll broadcast it live. Uh, we'll feed you if you come in. And then we will also have some Nate accredited courses uh, that go into that season as well. Um, contact info. I mean, if you guys don't know how to get a hold of us, this is our main line. If you call this number, you can talk to somebody just like Phil. I mean, he mentioned it earlier in the training. Our main goal with our customer service engineers is to get you in and get you out to the next job, okay? We want to help you guys move on to the next job and don't have to fiddle around and make your customer angry that they got to request another day off of work because you couldn't figure out what was going on in the system, okay? We've got a virtual tech app too uh, where you can actually use a FaceTime feature 
where you can see this beautiful mug, this big bushy mustache on your, uh, your iPhone or your uh, tablet, and he can help work you through so you don't have to do 20 questions uh, to help you One out. One advantage to that virtual uh, app is the factor of a lot of times uh, you didn't install the equipment and you're out on this job and you don't even know what whose zoning system is. They ripped the panel off or whatever. <laughs> the cover isn't there and all these lights are staring at you. All you got to do is turn your camera around and say, can you tell me what this is? I can tell you what it is. Uh, we're familiar with all the way back to the old days, guys. We, we pretty much know what system it would be if you can give us a visual clue. Uh, if you can't do that, take a picture, like a damper, for example. I don't know whose damper this is. You know, yeah. uh, it says Jackson Systems on it. Okay, we'll take a picture of it. You know, the motor doesn't work. Uh, is it three wire, two wire? I don't know. I can't see the darn thing. Or, you know, it's up above or something. Take a picture of it. Yeah. Shoot it to us. We'll tell you what it is. Absolutely. It takes just a few seconds. And, and especially with being able to actually see someone um, other than I, I don't like looking at JD. He's always trying to Ouch. mug shot and stuff like Ouch. that. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good tool to use. Shots fired. It's free. <laughs> it's absolutely free. Right. Uh, but don't call me up and say, uh, I got a carrier VVT system <laughs> and the master controller isn't working because I'm not going to be able to help. Right. Uh, we'll help you with everything we sell. That's right. <laughs> and here's, here's a big reminder, too, for everyone online and in person. We've got a survey. Please fill out the survey. If you fill it out online, we're going to pick someone at random and we're going to get you this great multimeter that Phil talked about. Okay, that everyone should have well, when nicer you're out than there. Mine, but it is nicer than yours. Yeah. Uh, this is from UEI. We're also going to do that. Everyone here, we've got some surveys. Or I think does everyone have a survey in front of them? I don't know where those papers are. Do you know, Ellen, where those are? We've got we've got a stack of surveys. If you guys will fill those out, I'm going to draw a random name in here. I'll do it real quick. You just fill it out real quick, and we'll also send you home with one of these. So it will be a random one. Okay. So again, fill out the survey. That just helps us, you know, if you want a different host or if you guys were too hot during the training or the food was ter terrible or garbage or you want uh, some other ideas for some training topics, please let us know. We want that feedback. Um, well, that's it, Phil. Uh, that was our first ever live field engineering episode. What would you think? Well, maybe our last. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in online. I'm going to talk to the guys here locally, but we appreciate it. Again, fill out that survey. Thank you for watching Field Engineering Live. We appreciate it. You have a good night.